Here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word. Boy, what a chapter, the 19th chapter of 1 Kings. We just ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Remember, this is where Elijah was fed by three different uh, methods and ways in this particular chapter, by um, the raven, by a widow woman, and then by the angels themselves, meaning God takes care of his own. But remember also, a little recap if we may, that Elijah was shown by Almighty God the earthquake and the storms and so forth, and God said, I'm not really into that. And then this still, soft voice. And really, that's the way God reaches people, is with that still, soft voice, meaning he's full of love and understanding, and that's the way he works, is by touching people's hearts. Now, that is not to say that the guilty he does not punish, because immediately following that, he would tell him, you're going to go over and you're going to anoint Hazael as king of Syria. Why? For a whipping boy for those that were uh, misbehaving themselves in idol worship. But God still works in that still, soft voice to those that hear him. And those that teach in his name basically must do the same thing. Teach in that still, soft voice, that voice of love and mercy is what it really means. But at the same time, sometimes you have to bear down a little bit, as our Father would have us to, or you kind of, you really, the message does not, uh, it's not delivered without the emotions that our Father places therein. It is strange because um, Haziel uh, means in the Hebrew tongue, uh, whom Yah sees, and it kind of tells Jehu means the living, and that means eternally living as well. And um, Nimsha means rescue, and I'm reading from the 16th verse, uh, translating rather than transliterating these names for you. And of course, Elisha means God his salvation, or God is our salvation. And we see in this that Elisha was a replacement for Elijah. He was told, you're going to go there and you're going to anoint him. This does not mean that Elijah is going to do it exactly in this order. He will do it as God directs him. As a matter of fact, it would probably even be Elisha who would yet anoint um, Haziel, but that's all right. It's still Elijah's work and his work continues as um, of when um, all the way to uh, even today. The, turning the hearts of the children back to the true fathers is uh, that continued work. Um, please do not misunderstand. I'm not saying that he has lived all down through the ages here on earth because he hasn't, as we'll find out as we continue in Kings. So, with that having been said, Again, God deals with love and mercy, but at the same time, when it, it is um, the guilt will not, the guilty shall not go unpunished, all right? So let's pick it up, if we may, in chapter 19, the first book of Kings, verse 17, and it reads, And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael Jehu, uh, shall Jehu slay. And him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Now, of course, Elisha was a prophet. And it is the sword of the Lord that a prophet uses. Uh, and um, there is no record, actually, of Elisha having uh, run anyone through with the sword. We will have, a, uh, as God, I feel, has a sense of humor, and it may seem strange to some, but we'll come to the story of Elisha, and I'll call your attention to it in um, uh, several lectures hence. Verse 18, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not, I repeat, have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Now, um, 7,000 
you will have this repeated in Romans, the 11th chapter. You'll remember God is answering Elijah here because Elijah was after um, Jezebel got on his case. He said, I'm all alone. I'm the only one left, God, that really is standing up for your work. And God said, hey, I got 7,000. So this, in a sense, is also prophecy that there would be, as it is written, 7,000 that would stand against the Antichrist, along with many kings and queens of the ethnos, which um, serve the same duty, same purpose, same calling, and they're not going to bow. They're not going to be deceived by the false Christ when he appears first in the very near future. Why? Because they, are, they have the seal of God, which means God's word in their mind, in their forehead, the seal of God in their forehead, as it is written in Revelation chapter 9. They're not going to bow, that is to say, worship the false Christ. And God is very assured of that. Now listen carefully as we continue, 19. So he departed thence, and he found Elisha, the son of Saphat, and... Um, Shaphat means to judge. It's, it's short for Jehoshaphat, which is to say God is our judge and he will be our judge, all right? Who was uh, plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, that's 12 pairs, before him, and he with the 12th, and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. That was basically a call to the um, prophetic ministry, we'll call it. Probably that would be the terminology. And he was, he was calling him as a prophet. Why? God calls prophets, and God told Elijah, you will anoint this one to replace yourself. Now, it's obvious at the same time, in as much as he's plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself is, has the 12th, that he was a very wealthy man at least from a very wealthy family. So why? Because God had blessed them. That's why God would choose him, that they would be obedient to the point that God would rain his blessings down upon them. Never listen to a knucklehead that tells you you have to be poor to serve God. That's just a, that's a false report. It's a teaching of Satan that um, people would think they had to be poor when they pray for God's blessings and, and it really makes our Father's Day to pour blessings out upon those that deserve it, those that don't. They're not going to get it. You don't have to worry. But it's obvious that he was a very worthy servant of God. And he's, God never misses a turn to teach. He will leave 12 pairs of oxen tilling and plowing his land or the earth and he will change to reaching the 12 tribes that have dispersed uh, in the prophetic sense to reach them to till souls, to cultivate and to harvest souls for our Father. Well, let's see if he accepts anyway. It's sometimes um, there could be one, but not if God calls them, okay? Verse 20, that would turn away is what I meant to say. But when God calls, they're going to serve, whether they like it or not, in a sense. Okay, with that mantle having been cast upon him, verse 20, and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. In other words, he had been touched by God and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Elijah answering, go back again, for what have I done to thee? Now, th this loses a little in the translation. What it's really saying is, certainly you go on back. This that I have placed upon you it, it does not overburden you or is not something that you can't handle. I haven't done anything to you that would keep you from having free will and option to love and show respect to your family. And I think it's important that you note that, that, that God, that's the way God operates. And inasmuch as the mantle was upon Elijah, naturally it would be handled in the way that God would choose it to be. Verse 21, 
And he returned back from him. He left Elijah and took a, a yoke of oxen, that's a pair, and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen. He took the yoke and the plow and built the fire and cooked the meat and gave it to the people and they did eat. And then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. He went along as his assistant or his servant or whatever you wish to term it. But we see the symbology within this, the finality or the final act of actually taking his tools at which he labored in the earth and fed with them uh, that, and opened the path to the new spiritual cultivation he was about to participate in. No questions asked. And as we continue, as a matter of fact, I, I will just share this with you. Elisha will perform with the help of God or with God doing it, and perhaps I should better have said that God himself will cause twice the miracles to happen with Elisha that he has with Elijah. So uh, to show you the increase of that ministry even though Elijah was taken without dying as we will cover. Now here we have it then. God has picked Elijah's uh, replacement so to speak and um, it would seem that he had compassion himself and that he did not choose to leave his parents without telling them goodbye and all the friends he had worked with and it's obvious he was a well-liked guy and of course if you can cook up a whole t uh, two, two oxen, which are pretty good-sized animals, and feed the whole community. That's maybe a reason he was well-liked in part. I jest in a sense. But no, he was well-liked. Chapter 20, verse 1, let's go with it. And Ben-Hadad, uh, the son of the mighty, is what the name means, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together, and there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. Now, these are vassal uh, kings, kings that uh, owe their loyalty to him, or he would, con he would take everything away from them, all right, and serve in the sense of the vassalage. Uh, and... Um, We'll have that term come up again, which means to, in name, serve because uh, you owe or you would be an enemy. All right, verse 2. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and he said unto him, Thus saith Benadad. And you're going to find out here, look, look into the heart of Ahab a little bit. Number one, he was married to Jezebel, so his choice of women wasn't really all that good. And he basically allowed her to do a lot of the ordering. So he wasn't all that much of a man to begin with coming out the gate. I want you to know that by analyzing his deeds up to this point. Verse 3, this, um, this Arab king states to him from Syria, verse 3, Thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also and thy children even the good list are mine. Um, well, now, you got to remember, who, who was Ahab's wife? Jezebel. What would his answer be? Verse 4, And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine, and all that I have. And again, he was thinking of this in the sense of a, a, a vast vassalage, a service, not necessarily that he was, in other words, it would be like paying a tax to him or tribute to keep him from taking him over. Uh, it's the same way uh, with the one world system when it comes to pass, that is to say with the Antichrist ruling it. 
um, you don't uh, you don't pay anything to it because you have to worship before you could even participate within it. Uh, I only mention that as as a type as we come by this place. So, hey, he said maybe maybe being married to Jezebel is one reason. Yeah, you can have my wife. All right. Uh, do I see humor in that? Yes, a little bit. I do. Verse five. And the messengers came again and said, Thus speaketh Benadad, saying, Although I have sinned unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver, and thy gold, and thy wives, and thy children. I mean, that just about cleans the old boy out, if you understand. Six. Yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow, about this time, and they shall search thine house. They're going to ransack it, is what they're going to do. And the houses of thy servants. And it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, whatever you place a value on, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. In other words, um, you must remember a great deal of what Ahab had didn't belong to Ahab. It belonged to God. He was the king of Israel at this time, not Judah, but Israel. And much of what he had would belong to God. It wasn't Ahab's to give. But this, it's, it is uh, obvious that he um, w would not be a, a, uh, a vassal king, somebody that would just pay tribute. He was, he was ripping him off. He was taking everything, uh, including the area, which this would kind of clear it up. Let's see what Ahab does about that. Verse 7. Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. It's about time he would come to that conclusion. For he sent unto, the, he sent unto me for my wives and for my children and for my silver, and for my gold, and I denied him not. I didn't turn him down on that. Verse 8, And all the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. You stand up to him. At least there was still some wisdom left in, in the tribes, the ten tribes. Verse 9, Wherefore he said unto the messenger of Ben-Hadad, Tell me, tell my lord, the king, all that thou didst send for to thy servant at the first I will do. Now, I'll pay a pretty hefty tax. And, and in word only, you can say, yes, I am the king, super king over Israel, as long as you keep your hands off of it. You can claim that, all right? Basically is what it means. But this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. In other words, uh, I'll pay the tribute and so forth, but I will not allow you to come in and ramsack Israel. It just won't happen. Now the Syrian king sends word back. Ten. And Benadab sent unto him and said, The gods, notice lowercase, gods plural, the gods do so unto me. And more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. In other words, I've got so many people that they're going to turn Samaria into dust when my army hits there. Verse 11, And the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. Uh, this is a, a, a bit of a um, parable in a sense that I, I find it amusing. It's, of course, what it's talking about is when you gird up yourself, that's putting your britches on, we could, we could make it the equivalent today. Putting your britches on is not something to brag about as much as a man that can rip them off of you can brag, all right? So they're, they're kind of mixing it up in the word department here. It isn't the one that puts on the harness that can brag, it's the one that takes it off. 
verse 12. And it came to pass when Benadad heard this message, and he was drinking, he and the kings in the, the uh, pavilions, that he said unto his servants, set yourselves in array, and they set themselves in array against the city. In other words, they were on a big toot, is what it was, a drunk. They're partying. And when, when he got word back from, um, from Ahab that it wasn't anything to brag about to be able to put your britches on, it was the one that could take them off of you that could do the bragging, they were in, I mean, that would be the highest of insults to a king over all of his so-called provinces there where he held them basically by fear. So he had no choice other than to answer in this way, all right? But he did it in a drunken stupor without any planning. Verse 13, And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. In other words, um, after he made the stand, I think it's important that you see this. Ahab with the elders, after they made the stand, then God sent the prophet, and then God assured them they would have the victory. But he did have to make the stand. Now, I think that would gain you a great deal in your life on this earth if you took note of that. And notice how our Father operates. Many might say, well, who was this prophet? Well, uh, how many prophets were in the area? Verse 14, and Ahab said, by whom? Question. And he said, the prophet that is, thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, who shall order the battle? Question. And he answered, thou, you're going to do it. In other words, the um, young men's servants even would be the ones that would do this. Verse 15, listen carefully. Then he numbered the young men of the princes of the provinces, and they were 232. And after them he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel, being 7,000. In other words, there were 7,000 warriors uh, of all the families with 232 leaders of the 7,000. That could answer a question that wonders in many people's mind and as much as Romans chapter 11 mentions a round figure of 7,000, that among that 7,000 there were 232 that would, um, no, I don't want to say be foremost, but would be leaders, basically. So as the witnesses will be all over the world, you might keep that figure in mind. I speak of, of the um, generation of the parable of the fig tree. Verse 16, and they went out at noon, but Benadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings. The 30 and 2 kings that helped him. In other words, all 32 of them, just, I mean, they are really on a drunk. Got a war going on, ordered the war. And verse 17. And the young men of the princes of the provinces went out first, and Benadad sent out, and they told him, saying, There are men come out of Samaria. Meaning, they may not be as much afraid of us as you think they are, dude. There are men marching out, verse 18. And he said, whether they be come out for peace, take them alive. Or whether they be come out for war, take them alive. And this was kind of an insult to his troops, meaning it would be a lot more difficult to take a warrior alive than it would dead. Uh, it would also take away part of the victory for a warrior. But he's on a drunk. And he's really, he's got the big mouth, all right? That's, that's what he's got here. That's um, verse 19. So these young men of the princes of the provinces came out of the city 
and the army which followed them, and it was considerably um, large, 20, and they slew every one his man, and the Syrians fled. And Israel pursued them. And Benadab, the king of Syria, escaped on a horse with the horsemen. In other words, he barely escaped with part of his cavalry when these 7,000 topped the ridge and cleaned house. They, they kind of, if you can understand the winning of a war, they kind of fight like the United States Marine Corps fights. You may lose quite a few men when you make a beachhead or take a line, but don't ever let them have slack enough to let their shirt touch their back after you once get them running. I mean, you take them or you're going to lose a lot more men. In other words, he dislodged them and simply picked them off as they ran. That's the way you win wars, okay? Verse 21. And the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. And it was a great slaughter. I mean, what a victory. It was a great victory. Verse 22. And the prophet came to the king of Israel. Once you produce, and this was Ahab, husband of Jezebel, uh, at, in command. God still sends the prophet back, even after the great victory, with what? And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go strengthen thyself, and mark, and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, that means come next spring, the king of Syria will come up against thee. Early in the spring, he's going to try this again. You're, so you get yourself, you refurbish your army and get them set because he's going to do it. 23. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain. And surely we shall be stronger than they. Now, what they don't know is that our Father, Almighty God, Yahweh, it isn't only that he picked Mount Zion, the mountain or the hill, because he likes it, and that the high place is always the place we place our, our um, holiest uh, markers or symbols or places of worship, but God also owns the valleys. God also controls the plains. In other words, woe be to the Syrian because our God's not a little local God. Our God, singular, controls everything. So the plain, in other words, they're kind of uh, whistling Dixie here, if you would, or, or uh, blowing hot air into the wind. Verse 24, and do this thing. Take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms. Now, this is, this is kind of funny, in a way. Uh, the um, the uh, people are telling him, get rid of those drunk kings and make, move them out of the commander-in-chief office and put people, put the military in there that knows what they're doing, because that's what actually beat them. Well, what actually beat them was... Uh, uh, we're going to change command is what they're telling him. Get those drunks out of here and let's put some people that know what's happening. Verse 25. And number thee an army like the army that thou hast lost. In other words, you build back up the same size army, horse for horse and chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain. And surely, surely we shall be stronger than they and he hearkened to their voice and did so. Well, normally you would think so because where Israel only had 7,000, they probably had 100,000 or maybe more. And um, that, uh, those numbers are beginning to take shape. That reminds me of a, of a, a battle one time where there were only 16,000 Marines and 120,000 Chinese. Well, that's the... Marines lost 2,500 men, and the Chinese lost 60,000 men. It was 
called Chosan. Verse 26, and it came to pass at the return of the year that Benadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Apec to fight against Israel. He's trying to pick him some plains here. He's about uh, six miles out from uh, the uh, Sea of Galilee here, getting a little flat ground. And uh, Apec means strength, and uh, he's... Uh, He's going for it, Aphek, rather. And verse 27, And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them, and the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids, but the Syrians filled the country. In other words, when, when the children of Israel, they, they split up in two groups. In other words, that would be, you can figure that out, at 7,000, that'd be 3,500 in each group with their leaders princes on these hills they all they looked like was two little flocks of goats grazing over on the side of the hill compared to the army that was down in this valley of the Syrians verse 28 and there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said thus saith the Lord because the Syrians have said the Lord is God of the hills but he is not God of the valleys, therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know. Now Ahab should have taken note of this. By this you will know that I am the Lord. It is I that's in control. Verse 29. And they pitched one over against the other seven days, sizing each other up, looking each other over, but there's that number seven again, spiritual completeness. And so it was that in the seventh day, the battle was joined and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians and 100,000 footmen in one day. So here we have 100,000 in that number, in one day. Of course, never forget, God was in control here. Watch this carefully, 30, verse 30. But the rest fled to Ahak, into the city, and there a wall fell, get this, a wall fell upon 27,000 of the men that were left, and Benadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. He's hiding. He's going from room to room. Now the 27,000 were hiding behind this wall with some, no doubt, brave hearts trying to climb to the top uh, to defend the wall. And God just has a way. There's no mention of an earthquake. All it would take was a still, soft voice from him. Or the very fact some scholars say, well, it must have been undermined. Well, that's, that's truly a possibility, the way you build on one uh, layer after the other in certain areas. But... I would say that it was the flimsiness of the structure that when these cowards were trying to hide behind it, then uh, with the activity above and the force hitting it, that it simply buried them alive. God performs miracles in mysterious ways. Well, it's kind of nature-like, all right? He gave them the victory, all right. He absolutely destroyed their army because he wanted Ahab and the rest of Israel, and yes, even the Syrians, to know that he was God of everywhere. People learned lessons slowly because, and because of that, we have atheists today and other religions and so forth when many wonderful things were performed in history, and it's well documented and even in man's history even in the king's history, uh, the events that our Father has performed for those that love him, for the blessings that he pours forth on those that follow him. How are you doing, friend? Think about it, all right? Our Father can do whatever he so chooses, can go wherever he so pleases, because he's the creator in the first place. It all belongs to him, and you're his child. 
amazingly, he loves each and every one of us, Jess, even you. And it really makes his day when you take a moment to appreciate what he has done. And hey, you know what? He's only getting started. His greatest blessings are yet to come to pass. And you're fortunate enough to be living in that generation. Think about it. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment. 